I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Joe. Trap House Digital. Maserati Rick in Detroit. Convertible bird in Miami. Graduated summa cum laude. Strip club made a tsunami. Carlton Hines with the ball game. Rayful Edmonds with the snowflakes. Craig Pettis in the M Town. Sal Magluta with the boat game. Falcone with the cocaine. Like Freeway Ricky with the plug game. Like Monster Cody in South Central. Larry Davis from Close Range. Who killed Willie Flukey Stokes is still a mystery tonight, but in our portrait of a pusher, a picture is emerging about who wants to fill his shoes. Unit 5 has learned exclusively that police are concerned about a possible drug war because three different big-time dealers would like to take over where Flukey left off. When Willie Flukey Stokes was buried, the head of the largest single independent drug operation in Chicago history was laid to rest. But the body of his drug empire is still alive and thriving and in turmoil. There appears to be three groups muscling for control of Flukey's $50 million a year drug network. One group is headed by Gordon Battle, Flukey's former partner. Another by Chuck McFerrin, Flukey's arch enemy. And the third by Sam Love Jr., Flukey's former associate. The struggle for control of Flukey's well-entrenched drug turf started, and members of Flukey's organization were brutally gunned down. Narcotics investigator Tom Shinnick. And they're vicious and violent enough that they would um, protect themselves at all costs. Unit 5 has learned that shortly before Flukey was murdered, a new cartel of independent drug dealers was formed and he began to fear a major drug war was imminent. On November 10th at this restaurant, Flukey met with this man, Chuck McFerrin. Police theorized that McFerrin is the self-appointed leader of the new cartel. Also at that meeting, Pedro Rodriguez, a man police consider to be a major supplier of cocaine and heroin to Chicago drug dealers. Rodriguez, believed to have organized crime connections in New York, Detroit, and South Florida, may have made a pact to deal only with the new cartel. The cartel is expected to take any action to gain control of Flukey's lucrative drug empire. And the big question is, how much is Gordon Battle willing to give up? Battle, known as Chip on the street, is Flukey's heir apparent. Battle lives in a fortress-like house on the far south side of the city. He was Flukey's partner for the last few years. Another group police believe could emerge as a major source of drugs is the Love family. Police discovered evidence of the Love's big-time drug business on January 19th, when narcotics agents raided this Alsop apartment house and confiscated more than a half million dollars in drug money. The cash, in mostly tens and twenties, belongs to Sam Love Jr. The street has been relatively quiet since Flukey was murdered, but police say trouble could erupt at any time, because in the drug business, takeovers are generally not friendly. Despite extensive criminal histories, none of these men have been convicted of serious drug offenses. Unit 5 has learned that federal drug agents have been investigating the fluky drug network for three years. And we have also learned that IRS was on the verge of indicting the flamboyant drug dealer for tax evasion at about the time he was killed. I don't think, Carolyn Ron, that this is the last we're going to hear. Willie Flukey, Flukey Stokes network. was a chameleon of sorts. To many, he was like a Robin Hood giving to the poor. To the police, he was nothing more than a drug-dealing gangster who would stop at nothing, even murder, to protect his empire. Flukey Stokes' violent death was consistent with a life full of corruption, dope-dealing, and murder. Flukey wanted people to believe his diamonds, cars, and cash came from Lady Luck. I'm a down Ah, uh, shoe poo, dice. Maybe in the beginning, but nine years ago, he traded in his dice and cards for cocaine and heroin. And Willie Flukey Stokes built a drug empire that left nothing to chance. Unit 5 has learned that Flukey's drug empire was making more money than anyone ever imagined. Authorities now believe his empire was grossing a million dollars a week. That's more than $50 million a year. Confidential federal drug enforcement documents obtained by Unit 5 reveal how big Flukey's organization was. Flukey was trying to hire hitman James Allen as an enforcer to protect his drug organization. At that time, according to DEA documents, Flukey showed him 22 kilos of heroin worth more than $60 million. That was at just one stash house. Flukey had an endless supply of cocaine and heroin, and he established a drug messenger service consisting of 30 to 50 runners who could deliver his drugs anywhere in the city 24 hours a day. His runners were equipped with beepers, like this one on Gordon Battle's attaché case. Unit 5 has learned that Flukey gave his runners only two ounces of dope at any time. Flukey limited the amount of dope he had on the street for a number of reasons. First, he could limit his losses if any of his runners got caught by the police, and he could keep better track of his dope supply if he gave everyone the same amount. 
And finally, he wouldn't give anyone any more dope until they paid for the dope they already sold. Flukey never handled the dope, he handled the money. And this man, Earl Wilson, started giving drug investigators an idea of just how much money Flukey was making and how much dope he was pushing on the streets. Wilson became an undercover operative for the police, and he documented six weeks of Flukey's activities. Here at 121 East 47th Street, Flukey set up office and counted his dope money, which was brought to him in gym bags, briefcases, and paper sacks. For example, Unit 5 has learned that on October 23rd, he counted as much as $200,000. On October 28th, he counted $60,000 from just one money runner, and on November 1st, three runners gave Flukey money. One of the bags contained $40,000. This man, Big Bill Hill, was Flukey's right-hand man. Pictured here in better days, his fingers were covered with diamonds and his hands stuffed with cash. On October 5, 1983, he was caught with 134 packets of cocaine and heroin. Until he was put out of business, prosecutors say he alone made $100,000 a week for Flukey's organization. And the money just rolled into Big Bill from the street people, who in turn rolled it into Flukey's Flukey would pockets. try to eliminate his competition any way he had to. On the street, it might mean murder. In the police department, it meant bribes. On May 26, 1984, at a barber shop on the south side, Leroy Dixon was gunned down, shot in the head. He tried to move in on Flukey's drug turf. Last January, on Merrill Street, Lavert Handy made the same mistake. He wanted to sell dope in Flukey's area. He ended up with a shotgun blast in the back of his head. On July 30th, in this parking lot, Anthony Brown was killed. He made the fatal mistake of robbing one of Flukey's runners and then refusing to return the money. For that, he was shot through the heart. Police say the man behind these murders was Willie Flukey Stokes. He was trying to protect his multi-million dollar drug empire, so he simply had his competition eliminated, according to police. James Delaney is commander of Area 1. We think he'd do anything to protect his empire. We think that he made his money dealing in drugs. Uh, we think he protected his interests uh, any way he had to, and if it led to murder, so be it. Flukey's criminal record spans a quarter century, arrested more than 60 times. Charges range from drug violations to murder. But since 1978, Flukey's life in crime seemed to come to a halt, even though his drug business was more profitable than ever. Unit 5 has learned while some police officers were working hard trying to put Flukey behind bars, others were on his payroll, secretly feeding him police reports and other inside information. It was after the funeral of Flukey's son, Willie the Wimp, that police got the surprising news. Flukey's informers penetrated the police department's detective division at Area 1. Stokes had been stopped by Las Vegas police while on a gambling junket at Caesars Palace. He was caught with Chicago mm -hmm. police mugshots of the suspects in his son's murder. Police tell Unit 5 it was not uncommon for Flukey to have stacks of confidential police reports. On raids or uh, when search warrants were executed in the past, uh, it would not be unusual to find police reports uh, in Flukey's possession. Did that surprise you as a prosecutor? Well, Flukey would have no real good reason to have police reports uh, unless he's trying to take care of his people. Drug investigators from the Cook County State's Attorney's Office through an undercover informant learned that Flukey had a lot of friends on the police department. Flukey would often spot police officers on the street and tell his bodyguards not to worry because, quote, they're my friends. Flukey suggested that if the police department had special details working late at night, he knew when they were out, where they were working, and who they were. Knowing that kind of information enabled Flukey to stay away from the police and to keep his empire operating without interference. He attempted to pay off police officers for police reports and we believe other things. We believe he was making an attempt to own the entire Chicago Police Department. Yo, 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 yo. We back. It's your boy Pop a lot. Mob ties. We on our way to shower with it. The South Side. All my niggas from Chicago, y'all niggas get in the comment box. Y'all know what it is. Like, we live around this bitch. Now, today, we're going to be covering a legend by the name of Willie Morris Stokes. But the whole world know him as Flukey. Now, a little bit about Mr. Flukey Stokes. He was born in December on the 12th in 1937. And like I said and stated earlier, he's from the south side of Chicago. He's mostly known for his flamboyant lifestyle, um, the diamonds, 
the silk suits, him being a notorious gambler, it said that it wasn't nothing for him to go to Vegas and spend two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on one weekend. According to the Chicago authorities, at the time of his death, he only ran the biggest narcotics distribution operation in Chicago. Um, and that, you could subtract none, that's Al Capone, that's everybody, that's shit, man. You know what's going on. But, like I said, yeah, he was pretty much known as a traffic, uh, a drug trafficking kingpin, um, is what they allege, even though he has never been charged. He stated that he never had a drink, never touched a drug, never sniffed a drug. Now, when I think about it, he kind of somewhat reminds me of John Gotti, um, in a sense, because it takes a kind of dangerous ass person to stare you dead in the face or stare the camera dead in the face and say hey i'm not such and such and such and you are on that shit <laughs> so he definitely had a poker face he really came to prominence i want to say in 1984 when he buried his son it was in february 1984 his his son and junior Willie the Wimp Stokes was buried in a Cadillac style coffin. He had hundred dollar bills stuffed in his in his hand, pretty much diamond rings all in his fingers. The casket had motherfucking white wall tires. That shit had working fucking lights, turn signals and shit. It was it's just ridiculous. Um so and not not to mention in 1985, he also threw a wedding bash for him and his wife that was covered by the Black Bible Jet magazine, where he spent $300,000 on that. Uh, according to the police, he was on his way to being indicted before his death. Uh, they was going to indict him for tax evasion, drug trafficking, and different other offenses. So... Pretty much by covering this story, I saw that 1984, 1985, and 1986 were pretty much the highlights and the climaxes of his life. Because in 84, he ended up burying his son, Willie the Wimp, who, like I said, um, was a junior, said to be a big gambler, just like his dad. In 1985, he ended up throwing his 30th year wedding anniversary um, for his wife, and in turn, he was murdered in 1986. And the, I guess, the speculation or everything behind his murder is, I want to, I don't want to say highly speculated, but you know, it's it's the it's the shit of myth. It's said that he was coming from his mistress's or his girlfriend's house, where he was set up and killed by his bodyguard it looks like at the time of his death it was like almost a power shift in the drugs the new organization was in the process of being set up so it the life is just pretty much like a movie yeah and it was two years from when he buried his son where he was killed in november of 1986 um and by all accounts compared to his son's funeral his was just a modest burial. But Fluky Stokes was one of the last of a dying breed. They pretty much don't have hustlers like this no more. These days, hustlers don't even live to be. He was 48 years old when he died. Uh, hustlers don't even live almost. So you, if you make it past 30 without a conviction or without being killed, you can consider yourself a success in this game so the shit and this shit just hit home on a lot of accounts man if y'all niggas tuned in y'all know the road down the streets man this is not a game that you're gonna retire from but y'all niggas make sure y'all follow me on instagram on twitter it's your boy pop a lot p-o-p -P underscore a underscore l-o-t we running through the city running through the nation we're gonna be in your city soon i promise and y'all niggas tap in, man. Y'all hit the comment box. Y'all hit me on my direct messages. Y'all get under the pictures. And we be back with more trails, real spill.
mob, 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 ties.